Good morning, Nashville. Good morning. <laughs> Excellent. Ah, uh, uh, yes, 9.30 p.m., my bad. All right, so, um, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, yeah, my name is Alan Faye. This is a talk about running a hackerspace. And basically, will be uh, sort of like my thoughts on running a hackerspace based on my experiences from running Free South Atlanta for close to three years. Uh, it's a little bit of info about me. Uh, there's all that stuff. Uh, yeah, there we go. And uh, let's get ready to bumble. Um, as you can see, this is uh, well, oddly, so. oddly, pre oddly <laughs> prescient um, slide. So, welcome. For those of you coming in, uh, thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is how the presentation split up. Uh, what is a hackerspace? How do you hackerspace and why? How can I hackerspace faster? <laughs> Daily operations, challenges, and the future, which is a vision quest. I'm in your place, verbing your nouns. Great. <laughs> what is a hackerspace? This is uh, a quick thing about them. Uh, square footage, drywall, tables, obtainium. This is uh, scrap material for use in projects. Uh, we have plentiful of it. Uh, but most importantly, it is both a community and a culture. So the, the first, four, uh, first five things are easy. Uh, you can easily obtain those things uh, through traditional or non-traditional means. Community culture is the two things that require work. So this is a few uh, screenshots from Freeside, uh, or otherwise known as photos. I like to think of them as screenshots. Uh, there we go. We have our mill. There's our uh, 3D printers back when they were all working. Uh, our tool room, some person soldering something. Uh, our kitchen, and uh, the off-road wheelchair project. Um, as Morgan Freeman puts it, uh, a hackerspace is a physical space where a community gathers and pursues personal development and culture. He really says that. Uh, let's see, how do you hackerspace? This is a great question. Um, basically, you should first ask why, because why is very important and critical here. The first important thing is that it's a place for your community to trade knowledge and physical space, shared possession, yes, and you want to improve the world in a tangible way, yes, and you like to explore and show off on tech talent and blah, blah, blah. This is all really good. This is very good reasons to hackerspace. But more importantly are good reasons why not to. Well, this is good. This is, uh, this is why I do it. I, I like to have a, a smorgasbord of everything geek. Um, Although I don't like the word club. I don't, I don't like club. That's the only thing I don't like about this image. But generally, everything else is more or less accurate. Um, this is kind of important. Um, a lot of people get into uh, wanting to develop a hacker space, but they realize that they don't need a physical space, but they still want one. You know, why do hackers need a uh, layer? You know, why do you need that? You don't. You don't. Well, um, a stupid question. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> You want to make money. That's actually another good one that uh, results in failure. Um, usually that goes along with people subsidizing your hobbies or a personal fabrication business. And, but most importantly, you think that it's easy. Uh, these are all terrible reasons to get into this. Uh, this is a great, great illustration of how not to have your chains. Uh, if anyone's seen that, that's one of my favorite movies. Uh, so this is more or less how Freeside got started, but this is actually a pretty common template throughout all hacker spaces. Is that at first, uh, you build the community first. So this is before you even go and look at a space, this is before you register a business, this is before you even like think about anything. Um, just go ahead and build a community of people. And a good idea is to do it once a week uh, because that once a week meeting is going to translate directly into your once a week open house that you're going to have 
at your hacker space, which is going to bring in more people, more and more people in your community. So I think bars are good. Um, a lot of people do tabletop gaming uh, at bars. Uh, those are excellent places. And for God's sake, tip well, okay? Like if you forget everything in this presentation, remember to tip well, because uh, that's Amen. paramount. Uh, other good places would be uh, basically anywhere that you can see yourself playing tabletop games, you should do it here, because making is a form of play, and you need a lot of room, and it's good to have large, wide tables, and uh, wooden surroundings, those also um, sacrifices that. Um, okay, so you're starting a business. You actually need a plan. So even though it's a nonprofit, um, you need to like come up with an idea of how you will generate revenue and so forth. Um, I recommend the route of immediately going for 501c3. Um, a lot of places uh, decide not to go that route. They'll incorporate it as an LLC or do some other kind of uh, weird things in order to say, hey, like. I'm gonna start up this space this way and then we'll turn it into a non-profit. No, just commit and do it. Um, because again, if you go for profit, you're going to have lots of fun. And so don't do that. Um, three to six months of operating costs. I mean, this is pretty much like if you go to sba.gov and you know the government's gonna tell you how to start a business, they'll tell you this stuff. And that's pretty easy, you know? And then this one is very key though. Um, this is worse than like marital arguments, uh, where the space will be located. This is awful. Um, and this will bring out the worst in people. Um, so this is, you know, these are completely anecdotal and made up, but they're made up based on facts. And this is like stuff that I've surveyed on, on many different hacker spaces, not only in the Southeast, but also just throughout the U.S. I don't know that this applies to European hacker spaces, but at least in America, uh, 20 to 25 founding members is like the bare minimum um, across the board. Uh, I talked to different founders and they pretty much say, yeah, it was about two dozen people um, every time. And that's for a small space. For a much larger space, the number tends to hover around 50. And those seem to be pretty fixed numbers. And I think there's good reason for that. Um, but that gets into um, what are called like the magic numbers and groups. So there's 7, 30, and 150. 150 being Dunbar's number, which is the largest number of a tribe where everybody knows everybody else. And 30 being the number of people that are most familiar with one another. And 7 being the people that you can reliably communicate to on a regular basis. So that ends up completely translating here. Uh, as you can see, if you have a core group of seven people, and those people in turn communicate to seven people, that tops out at around 49. So that's how you get these numbers in this kind of distribution. So that makes sense. It, it squares with the, with the knowledge. But again, this is completely anecdotal. It's just what I survey. And um, also expect a third to two thirds of the community drop out once you set the location. So if you remember that horrible argument, um, you know, you didn't locate it next to my house like I wanted, so I'm not going to be a part of this anymore. Uh, that's what happens. And pretty much you need to plan for that. So if you're going to open a large space of about 10k square feet and you have your 50 members, ask yourself, can I pay the rent with 25 members? Pretty much. That's kind of like what I would recommend. Um, yeah. So this isn't so much about doing this faster, but really like what kind of stuff goes wrong. Uh, and things can go wrong for any number of reasons, but mostly it's um, lack of rules, um, lack of uh, really getting participation with people, and lack of um, good leaders just putting their, their feet down on a uh, variety of topics. So one of the biggest reasons is that you'll get a really cool tool, like a 3D printer, and it will break, um, as 3D printers are want to do. So no one will go and repair the 3D printer. So now you have a critical piece of your hackerspace infrastructure that's completely broken. And 
Same goes with any other large expensive tool. You'll say, well, I don't know. I can't really get this repaired. So that's an issue. Uh, do you have enough basic tools? We used to joke at Freeside, one of our taglines was, we almost have everything you need to complete your project because you'll need like that one bit and we'll have like 16 bits, but bit number 15 is missing, so you can't actually drill that thing in. Um, so that's kind of like very important and kind of overlooked. So these are just basics. Cleanliness is really important. Um, the reason it's important to keep it clean is not because that keeps the roaches and the beta critter away, but really because this is what attracts people to the space. If they come and see a, a clean space, they'll feel like they can work there. If they come and see a dirty space, they'll think, I just have to go and clean this. Maybe, some people. Uh, let's see. Room for projects is the same kind of thing. If people walk into a space and it's too cluttered, then they're gonna say, well, I don't know if I can work on that cool thing I wanted to here. Uh, all the members current on dues, how are your year-to-day revenues and expenses? What is your membership gain loss trend? If you ask people whose hacker spaces are failing these questions, they will not know the answer. And this is just basic accounting. This goes beyond just bookkeeping. This is like, hey, collect stats. Like, a Google spreadsheet is cheap. It literally costs you nothing. So start recording everything. Start recording how often members sneeze. You know, like, just whatever you want to collect, just collect it. You don't even know if it's going to be important. Just do it. Uh, <laughs> And enforcing the rules, this is very important. Uh, it's not NOM, you know, we, we are civilized, we can do this. Uh, here's some quick fixes uh, for all sorts of things. But basically, what this is, is arranging of incentives. Uh, what you're doing when you're managing a hacker space, which is a distributed space of people working on varying products with varying interests, and varying degrees of cleanliness, organization, and knowledge is you're manipulating incentives. So you're trying to play with different variables to get people to do the right thing and sort of migrate the herd in a direction without really worrying too much about individuals. So what is it actually like, though, to, to run a hacker space? You know, um, there's some level of facilities management involved, um, as you can see. Um, there's finances. Movement, good choice. And then events. Uh, <laughs> if anyone's seen Community, it's like my favorite scene ever. Uh, it's once more with feeling. Um, Matt knows this. Matt just walked in. You know this feel, right? You know this feel? Okay, good. Um, so challenges to running the space. Um, so again, right, incentives. So one thing that, um, you know, when you have a mailing list, you know those threads that have like 300 messages? This was one of them. Um, like what works, paid versus free classes, you know? But if it's free, everyone will just consume as much of it as possible. And I'm like, well, can you see how that's not necessarily a good thing sometimes? Um, this doesn't work for a number of reasons. Uh, the most interesting thing was the argument that if it's free, people will take as much of it as possible. It's true for candy, but it's not true for education. So what actually happens is that nobody comes to a free class. How can this be? You know, it's free. What's wrong with you? Uh, what's wrong is that the incentive structure is all messed up. So. The funny thing is, if, if you pay a small fee, then you're, you're obligated to go to the class. You're like, oh, well, I spent $5, so I might as well go on that Wednesday where I'm not doing anything. Whereas if you didn't pay anything, nothing gained, nothing lost either. So people would just stay home. And then instructors need to be paid too, because then they're not going to show up. So then you've got like, the students that paid for a class, and the instructor is teaching for free, and the instructor didn't show up. And if the instructor is the only person with the key card, you have an angry mob that you can see over the webcam, like outside your space, like banging on the door, like that scene in Clark's. It's good. Uh, and then, of course, there are costs for everything, right? Lighting, just to a bare minimum. The lights turned on, that's about like five bucks, you know, whatever. Uh, 
this was more or less trial and error. Um, one thing that I found by doing classes in many different ways was most people are going to go to an easy introductory class where they're going to get something tangible. It doesn't even matter what that thing is. They're like, button stamping 101, you know, I stamped a button, you know, I got something cool, I paid $30 for that class. Like, that works. But then, but if you have a series where you're like, first you're going to stare at the button and then you will stamp it in class two, you know, that doesn't work so well because no one shows up to class two. They're like, I spent that entire class just looking at buttons and I didn't learn anything. Um, we didn't actually have a class like that. If that was an, an example. Um, this one, again, the cleaning of the space is very important. Um, we still haven't quite figured out the incentives on that one yet. This is all trial and error, but uh, we do try different things. But especially keeping the churn of the projects moving is important. What typically happens is if you have any kind of an open table, it will be filled with stuff. And so at some point you need to move that stuff. Like that's sort of like a golden, uh, you know, invariant of a hacker space. It's like, is this table clear? It will be filled with stuff. I don't care what it is. Uh -huh. So then this is kind of uh, weird. This is like a unique problem to um, hacker spaces. And we, we, this happens so often, we came up with a term for it called the mimetic infection. And these are folks that show up um, to your hacker space. And no, this happens. Like, I don't know. Like, th this does not happen in like a public space, but this happens in a hacker space for some reason. I've never been anywhere on Earth except for Freeside where this, this happens. Obama's a teaser flaw. Yes. Uh, which that website is down, and that made me so sad. This is the most description. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the one that like irritates me the most, like everything here is easy to deal with. Um, the free energy people are kind of funny because they're like, I saw this YouTube video and I wanted to come here and show it to everybody, you know. And I'm like, yeah, that marble is definitely moving around that. Um, but the, the hackathon, the hackathon to me is like the worst. Because like a hackathon is a company that's like, well, we have sort of some dumb ideas and we want to throw some free labor at it. So here's some pizza and like, go. And you know, you get like awesome results. Um, and uh, <laughs> so enough, enough on that. I, I, I have like uh, actual emails I can show um, to individuals um, and if you don't believe me that this happens. Um, this is the, after two years, this was like one of the most important lessons I learned was do not make every single person happy. Um, eventually you will in some way or another, but don't make that your goal. You have to make users happy. And you have to make a class of person happy. And these are the four people that I try to make happy. Um, this might vary from hacker space to another. But uh, one critical thing to note is a hobbyist that needs equipment and not space. Uh, this is very critical. I had an open house night where I was giving a tour and I was letting everybody know, you know what our capabilities are and blah, blah, blah. And this dude walks around and he's like looking around like this and puts his hands on his hips and goes, yep, I could definitely see myself building my Cessna here. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, like, we cannot, you cannot install your plane inside the middle of the space. Like, this is not going to happen. So, you know, you want to cater to a certain type of hobbyist. The hobbyist that wants to use tools and learn how to use them. Um, students that want new skills, enthusiasts for a thing. Uh, and an artist that wants to make something awesome. Th these are the four people that I talk to. Um, everyone else, I just, I do different things. Um, I'm usually not me, let's put it that way. Um, this is sort of like, uh, this is where the presentation will go off the rails, because uh, these are just my own opinions uh, based on the trends I'm seeing and kind of like the direction of where I think this hacker space movement thing is going. For starters, it's not going to solve education. Uh, everyone's saying it's the next thing in, in K through 12 education. And I'm just like, well, no, that's terrible. That's not gonna happen. Um, you know, 
So this is more focused on problems of the future. Actually, so, I, I have to ask a question here. Being an education professor, I have to ask, why do you think this is not the future of pedagogy? Because they think it's too easy is the first answer that comes to mind. Um, most of the educators that I've spoken with seem to believe that if we put 3D printers on a food truck and label it a moving maker space and roll it into a high income, privileged neighborhood preschool, that we will solve the education problem in this country. And <laughs> your eyes are like, you're like, whoa. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's just not the way it works. Uh, this is a really thorny, complicated issue that's multifaceted and like touches on issues of class and race and like, you know, we could go all day talking about like how to actually fix education, but I can assure you it's not 3D printers on a truck um, at the end of the day. Or even like bringing back shop class, you know. Uh, good luck with that because those same privileged folks that watch shop class will want you to install a saw stop and or you know they're not going to let anybody do anything fun. Uh, that's one of the key reasons that Freeside's 18 and up. Uh, there's a K-12 hacker space that opened up in Atlanta that's doing very well. It's going to get super well funded. Half their money went into a saw stop. Um, that's, if you're not familiar with this, this is a table saw. Um, there's videos of this where like, you know, you, you take a hot dog and like, this is a really expensive use of a hot dog, but, but you can take a hot dog and like put it on the table saw and it will come to a stop. So it won't actually cut the hot dog. The implication means that the hot dog's like your finger if you were like using a table saw. So that's really cool, but like it costs several thousand dollars to like replace the blade or whatever when that happens. So. Uh, in any case, like, I could, like, privately tell you all of my things, although I pretty much laid it out there. Um, Thank you. you know. Yeah, That's awesome. Fine. Is that is that satisfactory a little bit? Or? For panel answer, yes, because I don't expect panel answers to be necessarily detailed, but at least to address the surface level concerns that the question originally was probing for. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, highly, it's a highly political thing, too, you know, like, I don't know, like, there are days where running the hackerspace, I ask myself, why did I suddenly become responsible to educate all of Atlanta's youth, you know? Uh, and so, if the answer to that question is no, you know, I'm not responsible. So, I'm just some guy that happens to run a hackerspace. Uh, so yeah, I have kind of two views, um, and this is sort of stuff that's been echoed recently is that the future holds for itself kind of like a simultaneous utopia dystopia. Um, these are the good things about the future. These are the not so good things about the future. And I was sort of like, sort of what drives my philosophy for how I think about a hacker space and like where the trend goes. Looking back, the first inklings of this type of notion came with communes. So there's a bunch of communes. I'm especially fond of the uh, the Freetown Christiana I was commune. This summer. Cool. Was it cool? Did they have the giant rock that they rolled in front of the? That wasn't famous. I don't remember a giant rock. I think I think they've kind of mellowed out about it. They've kind of come to terms that it's just going to happen there, and like they're just going to chill out. Sort of. I mean, sort I was of. I was intrigued. Like they don't, of course, they don't really make anything public there. But I had gone to one of the small staircases and just climbed up to like the third floor of one of their buildings, and then saw the stuff happen. Not like Fisher Street or stuff like that, but right. like people were actually building things. Yeah. So. So you know that was like really cool, you know, hack the society, um, that concept. And then we have like, what I call like the culture jamming era. You have like Suicide Club and the Catholic Society and that kind of all culminated with Burning Man and kind of died with it too. Um, well, I don't know, I mean, it's still, it's still, it's what you make of it, right? 
But um, this was sort of like culture hacking, right? Uh, Negative Land and the other artists that kind of explored this concept of like culture jamming. And we're participating on their show this weekend. What? You're kidding? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah, he does, you know, the Over the Edge Halloween yeah, yeah, show. I that. And you can actually like call in and, yeah. you know, contribute to Negative Land this week. Yeah. Can I be part of that, please? We'll find Drew and he'll still look at Right on. Um, so it brings up an interesting point. You know, like, uh, the more I read about this stuff, the more these threads are interwoven. Um, it makes you feel like part of the cosmos. Um, <laughs> in any case. So, and then we get into this, like, infosec era. And, you know, you have your, you guys all know this. This is, this is Hack the Computers. Um, but what's interesting about this, society, culture, computers, and now we're in hack all the things, right? Um, it's kind of an interesting progression, right? Like, you start with society, you know, this lofty, ambitious goal that's not gonna happen, and then you go to culture, and then you have computers, and then things, right? Because all things are computers now. Yes? Yeah, I live about 15 miles from the farm. There, this list that I'm here. Yeah. I've met a bunch of those people, and I just thought you'd like to know that, that uh, uh, all that land that they had has now been split up in its own privately and individually by the various founders. Yeah. And all the original ideals, you know, uh, were found to be unwieldy. Yeah. I mean, for that concept. Yeah. Um, if anybody's interested, I can tell you quite a bit about yeah. what they did and how it was formed and how it fell apart. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's like, well, that's the challenge in any shared system. I mean, that's, if you think about it, that's just even a microcosm of the United States itself. Oh, yeah. I mean, the United States is a fractured place. Oh, yeah. a, lot, a lot of people, so. you know, have the feeling that the United States is real solid and it's going to be there forever and they don't realize how young it is. And, and, uh, how yeah, you know, how just fragile. the... Yeah, just the death throes of an empire, that's all. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, I just, I just like this progression, is what I'm trying to say. Like, I, I like the idea that somewhere along the way, society and culture became equated with the technology. And if you think about it, that's the entire fabric of our society and culture now, is technology. So, really, has anything really changed? So, I think that the next era in hackers, how, how hacker spaces will evolve is two things. I think this makerspace K-12 thing is a fad, it's gonna go away just like, you know, any sort of like educational salvo thing. But what's really gonna stick around, or what's the next iteration, is going to be going back to that society and culture, because we saw society and culture trending into technology, and now technology is trending back to society and culture, and so, activism is actually going to mean something instead of slacktivism. So I think we're going to see people try to, especially in light of the NSA and privacy, I think people are going to try to work towards restoring some kind of a balance there. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we've crossed, you know, like some line that we'll never be able to get back to, but I don't, I don't believe that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, what this model has as far as an impact on greater society and culture and how we organize, right? Because we're so connected and spread out over the world now. And then biohacking. Um, this is actually gonna be huge. Um, we're getting into um, sort of like embedded and wearable devices and that sort of thing and we really don't there's no way to predict how that's gonna fall out. We have no idea of what effect that's gonna have on people and their relationships. And maybe these two things are related, right? Maybe they're both like two sides of the same thing. People pushing their own personal boundaries and then in turn those things pushing on society itself, so. Um, I just went through a few like random scenarios like Pretty much, if you've seen any movie based off Philip K. Dick, I'm pretty sure that that stuff's going to happen. Um, and I think that some hacker spaces will play a role 
and filling gaps in problems that people have that society can't meet, which is sort of what we're seeing now. Um, the problem that I see now, one thing that, that drives people to a hackerspace is that they do not have the creative outlet or, um, or space in which to express creativity and do their own research and think about their own stuff within their day-to-day -day lives. And that's what's drawing them to the hacker space. And I see people that drive 50 miles to come to Freeside. And they're not coming there because we have working 3D printers. I assure you don't. Um, they come there because we have a culture that's giving people a space for which to express themselves creatively. So, you know, our whole notion of work needs to change, but yeah, that sort of thing. Um, this is something that I'm heavily interested in. Um, I like open source hardware. Um, I like this concept. I like the idea of being able to manufacture some hardware that is verifiable and that you've manufactured yourself. Right now we have lots of cheap hardware that comes to us from all over the world. We have no idea how it's put together and there's no way to really verify that that stuff is secure. Maybe some of this privacy stuff makes us rethink that approach and we'd be interested in more local homegrown pipelines for developing this sort of stuff. And people are working on it. Um, those are at least a couple of good projects there. Um, I like this thing. That was my favorite thing from that movie. Um, but basically, like, sort of like a anonymizing suit. So yeah, that's what I want to close it on. Um, that's it. Reminiscent of uh, Microsoft's 1995, where do you want to go today? <laughs> I yes. did not Thank think you. about it. I did not think about that. <laughs> so yeah. Questions? Stump the hacker. <laughs> if you could join any hippie commune, which would you join? Oh, if I could join any hippie commune. There's actually a um, there's a space in out outside of Reno that opened up. Um, that is not like a commune. I don't think they actually have living space, but they're an extremely large facility that's open year round to develop giant art for Burning Man. Um, and I think that would be awesome. I don't know if they have artists in residence that just, I mean, I would imagine if you're working that hard on something year round, then, you know, yeah. Building on that, earlier you said that the, um, oh, Goodness, the infosec sort of ethic had um, gone to Burning Man and died there. What did you mean by that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I think I think what I was saying that what died there. I I think like um, I think to a, to an extent the notion that we can pull off. I think it was touching on something that he said, which was you know this notion that like we can't actually live together. Like, the fact that that notion is dead, I think it's just out of style, if that makes sense. Like, people, I don't think, believe that anymore. Or at least a good portion of them certainly don't uh, believe that it's possible to live together with people. Um, and again, they kind of had problems with New Harmony, which was the commune in Indiana in the 1840s or so. Yeah. I mean, and, and then you have uh, Robert Owen's uh, utopian kind of exercises when he came to the to America. Well, so too. so that's a huge that's a huge difference between those experiments and hacker spaces because the the main large experiment is that a hacker space is not trying to prove something. Communes in the past, even like well, take any commune. I mean, we had, you know, uh, communist communes, you have like Christian communes, you had all sorts of stuff, right? Like any spectrum of like thing. But what they were trying to do was they were trying to prove that their utopia was correct. And that's not what a hacker space 
you know, hackerspaces don't really have those goals. Like on the whole, if you could identify, like, what is the goal of these hackerspaces? What are they trying to do to us? Um, we don't really have that, right? We have just like play. We just have exploration. And I think that's really good. I think it's good to not go back to that. Um, not try to force a utopia, if that makes sense. It does, although I'm kind of wondering, it's, there's this intentional absence of this of an ideology, although it makes me tempted to already try to find a ideology that might not be verbally expressed, but one that is inherent in the assumptions that are under the system. I mean, you know, you could argue that information wants to be free as an ideology, or we should make these sorts of alternative attempts to cultivate hardware in ways that better suit us as sort of an ideology, but it's not certainly the all-encompassing socio-cultural kind of ideology that you're going that you would have found in these more overarching kind of utopian spaces that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And I also think that like part of the purpose of a hackerspace is kind of to figure that out for the community that it's operating in. So if you want to develop a community of, say, preppers, that's going to be a very different space from a community of people who want to be artists. So while those spaces are going to have similar tools and similar ambitions and similar growth and similar issues, clearly the society, those mini societies and cultures are going to develop in totally different there, there are two. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. No. no so there, there are two pretty successful uh, uh, hacker spaces in Huntsville. Yeah. The the, the Makers 256. Yeah. And then the Mind Gear Labs, and they both uh, are, are there for different reasons. The yeah. People that are members say we go to to the uh, to Makers for the ideas. We go to Mind Gear to, to build. It. Yeah. They have commercial laser cutters and CNC machines and things. And the cool thing about that is that. Um, like for me, like Makers Local is definitely like one of those inspirations for me for Freeside because it reminds me that we can keep growing. Um, I forget just exactly how many members um, Makers Local has. I think it's, I've heard between 40 and 60. It's, it's almost 80. Almost 80. So see like Freeside's sitting at 60 and we live in Atlanta and that's like how many more times the population, right? But that speaks to a certain extent of the problem of geography, right? Um, Atlanta just being way too spread out. But still, I mean, there's no reason, right? Uh, or at least there shouldn't be. But that always makes me sort of examine, well, what are some of my own blind spots with respect to that? So it just reminds me, like, looking at spaces like that, and even in places that are even smaller than Huntsville, they still have the same type of like membership numbers and like people that really support that community. So those are the spaces that I really kind of look under the microscope and I'm like, what makes you guys tick? And in all cases, it's that people are really, really tight. Um, they're really good to one another and they really care and they want to try to teach everybody. And, you know, that. There are very few anthropological constants that hold across all human societies, but the 30 slash 7 rule that you came out for yeah. remarkably holds up across humanity. And it drives the agricultural anthropologist nuts because we're always looking at the differences between societies. And finding one of those constants just makes us want to pick it apart. We still have found a good way to do it. So the rule still stands. Yeah. No, it definitely does, and we actually took that into account when we were trying to design um, our uh, sort of our organizational structure. Um, we've tried a hierarchy um, because we were inspired by Rick Falkvinge's uh, Swarmwise book, um, which touched on those topics, and so we're like, well, if it worked for the Pirate Party, it should work for us, right? But the thing is, like, there's a fundamental difference there. And I think that uh, that's sort of organized for a singular purpose, right? It's to get people elected. And if we were to really try to engineer a distributed approach, we just got to play with that. So 
I've had some ideas, and we're about to get a new board actually in like four days at Freeside. So however that shakes out, um, with those folks, we're going to try to work with them and see if we can come up with sort of a new model for uh, organizing the space and getting stuff done. Because hierarchy is not working. Um, mostly because we've had, we're, we're at this weird growth juncture where maybe you guys ran into this problem at Makers Local, but uh, we grew to this size and we're big enough to start having the big problems from size, but we're not large enough to have enough leaders come in and fill the roles we need in order to manage those problems. So that's kind of an interesting obstacle. Like, it, it's almost like I, I sound like a broken record sometimes because I'm like, let's just keep adding members until like it just fixes itself, you know? Even though I know that's not the right answer, like, it's just like trying to throw large numbers at the problem, so. Is there a magic ratio of leaders to people that you could insert here? I don't, I don't know. I, I really just do not know the answer to that. I think, I think it really isn't um, a ratio so much as it is engineering a system. And uh, one example would be like distributing uh, management of events, right? Uh, that's something that's typically run by one person at Freeside now, me. <laughs> and uh, I've been taking aims to try to get that spread out to people. Uh, and that's, you know, you have to do that in a way that's accountable, that doesn't stop people from doing it and make it easy for them, but don't make it too easy so that they don't do things. So, yeah, it's tricky. It's a lot of trial and error. So. Yeah, we, we call those uh, the gift of the Magi moments. It's, uh, you know, like, uh, the, the classic example was we had an open house Tuesday night, and one guy was like, I have an internet-connected coffee maker. And some other guy, he's like, but I don't know how to write software for it. And the guy's like, well, I have coffee, and I know how to write that software. You know, and they got married. Uh, but, uh, I mean, like, uh, the one thing that we are focusing on, at least for this coming year, is we divide our space into different zones of activities, but now we're going to try to see if I can get people excited about chaining those into pipelines. So one pipeline that we have is we have a couple of people that are really interested in cosplay. Dragon Con and the movie industry is getting huge in Atlanta. So, well, Dragon Con has been huge. Uh, but these folks make a living doing this, so they were talking about, well, let's have uh, 3D printing of masters, mold making, and then doing copies of casting copies of those. And I'm like, that sounds awesome, because you touch on so many different tools, and people that go through that tool chain will learn so much along the way. So that's kind of like one approach we're taking to that. Um, but a quick follow up to that, I like the, uh, the pipelines of interactivity. Where do you think maybe a software group or some sort of like web development group kind of fits into a hackerspace, or is that a separate thing? So can that scale out? And so one of the one of the nasty truths about a hackerspace is that it is filled with software developers and IT folks, and nobody wants to work on software because that's their really job. And the sad thing is, you still need to because while the nature of your projects that you're building is very different. Uh, you still need that software expertise and knowledge to actually execute on those projects. Whether even it's just like, like I don't know if you guys saw the uh, the Crimson Fist uh, talk today, but he was talking about how he didn't have the skills to like pull down the data from KML, and and he had to manually copy stuff over by hand. Well, I see folks that 
Freesight is actually lucky in that we do have like some people that aren't from software backgrounds. I would say about a good 60% of our members are though, exclusively software developers with zero construction and building and making skills, and then we have fabricators. So that's really hard to do, especially like if your space is entirely uh, founded by software developers. Freesight started out that way. It was a bunch of Google folk and um, a lot of like software developer friends that they knew, and that quickly did not work. Um, also, I didn't know what they were trying to do either, um, because at one point it was like a shared workspace, or at some point too it was just supposed to be like a hacking lab, like in the style of Loft or Cult of Dead Cow and that sort of thing. But yeah, I don't know. I think like sort of not having that focus and vision is also kind of a big part of it, but I know that, like, as far as culture goes, too, like, I think one weird thing that's happened is we haven't been able to set up a, um, a pipeline to do uh, printed circuit boards, because certain members that are into that, they have pipelines where they take their designs and ship them to China, and then get boards manufactured and sent back. They don't feel like they want to bring that to Freeside, because then they feel like, well, maybe I'm going to get more people doing this stuff and they'll compete with me. Like, they're not probably going to make the same product you're doing. So that's kind of like a weird thing. And so we get, like, resistance on doing certain things because people feel like that threatens them. It's, it's odd. So. Well, on that note, yeah. and I'll, I'll hand over the microphone in a second. But on that note, what do you think the healthy balance between a hacker space or a maker space and business forces is, I mean, how do you, and I mean, how do you manage that? You guys have been around for a while, so. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I take a very, um, uh, I, I don't know that it's popular, um, but I do definitely have an opinion on that. I feel like, and, and this translates to how I run the space, I feel like a nonprofit space is a nonprofit space, and it should operate in that context. If people want to make money, a nonprofit hacker space is a really terrible place to do that in. That said, um, well, for one reason, like let's take intellectual property. The, if you were actually running a machine shop where people had intellectual property concerns, a hacker space is poorly equipped for you to do that. You know, you need to have like a security system, you probably need offices, all that infrastructure to protect intellectual property starts adding up and it's very costly. So while I don't tell people that they can't do that stuff at Freeside, I tell them you're probably better off doing open source stuff just because then there's no worry about, okay, well, who's gonna profit off this? And you can still profit off of open source software anyways, so it's kind of like a moot. Um, but I think like, I talked recently to one of the directors of uh, Family Lab and Sunshine Labs over in Orlando. And she said that what they do is, it's sort of like a symbiotic relationship, um, which I guess, um, I forgot who, uh, who said about the two different hacker spaces um, in Huntsville, I guess that was you, right? The different, um, you have like the commercial space and then, uh, it's gone now. It's yeah. the Makers Local 256, and then there's a, a little place called uh, Mind Gear. Which yeah. is, it's a commercial space, right? It is, it is. They're separate yeah. things, very much. So. But, I mean, that's good, though, because what you kind of want is, I think you want to be in an environment where people who already know what they're doing don't dominate it. So I think the model of a gym is terrible. Uh, I don't want to see a hacker space as a gym, because a gym by definition of that business model, serve a few. Whereas a hacker space should serve everybody. Oh my god, you people look so drunk. You should get in here right away. Excellent, come on in. Oh, okay. Oh, he'll be fine. This one. The future, and you've got L cards? I'm okay with this. What do we miss? As we like to say at Freeside, the only limit is yourself. Correct.
So yeah, I don't know, anything else? I'm more or less done, I'm just having fun. Can you go back to that slide about the dystopian aspects? Yeah. And his slides are on the website. Yeah. yeah, this is like a publicly shared Google thing. This may or may not necessarily apply to the U.S., but it will definitely apply in the other countries, especially that last point of denial of opportunities. And even if it doesn't apply to the U.S., it could also be really hard to prove that an employer is doing that. So... Just some stuff I read about. <laughs> Nothing new. On that note. Thank you. Thank you guys for being patient and awesome.